gonna pretend I'm all better Though we were forever Heart still in pieces And your shadow follows me places all the time I can't shake this feeling Of loneliness That's just life I guess But I believe Someday soon I'll learn to Overcome it The scars will heal Heart will bloom No more toilet Uh, today will be the last uh, lecture with uh, new material for CSE 141, so you must be happy with that. But even though this is the last lecture, we still are go we are still going to give you a very fruitful uh, knowledge about what's the current architecture, and definitely that will be a big part in the final. But before we start, it's always good to see uh, why we are here. So, uh, uh, so you know. Before the midterm, you saw the pipeline uh, processor. Uh, you saw the processor is a, just a pipeline, like a MIPS five stage pipeline. But for, uh, from the lecture starting from the net, net, uh, this Monday, uh, we are trying to tell you that this is not the fact that it, that's not the world that you are living right now. And this is actually the world that you are living right now. So in a world that you are living right now, uh, not only you have the instruction fetch and decode stage, and because we want to perform out of the execution, so we also have the register renaming logic 
try to eliminate all false dependencies within your code and also have the issue schedule stage to put your instruction into execution. And instead of a single pipeline, we have multiple pipeline uh, that can be running in parallel. So like you can have a floating point pipeline, you can have an integer pipeline, you can have a multiplication pipeline, you can also have a memory pipeline. And uh, at the end, there is a reorder buffer, try to uh, uh, commit this instruction or say have this, com uh, the, this instruction complete in order. However, one thing that uh, remains the same uh, from the beginning at the end is that, well, we, we need a branch predictor to help us predict what instruction uh, uh, can we execute. And, and because we, you have the pr prediction, so you also need a reorder buffer to help you uh, keep track of those instructions that are still not available for, uh, uh, is, we are still uncertain about if they are going to be executed or not. And if you look at the design of the processor, you can definitely, you can, pro, you can, you can potentially look at the processor in two different ways. Like uh, the first part, which is the uh, everything before the schedule, we can consider them as the front end. And everything after uh, is schedule is the back end. So the front end is just feeding instructions to the, uh, the pipeline. And uh, the back end is trying to consume those instructions. So, uh, the big part in this uh, uh, this 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 uh, modern processor design is the register renaming, and the basic idea of register renaming is that you need physical registers uh, and a mapping table uh, from architectural register to physical register, and allocate physical register for each output, and this would help us to eliminate all false dependency. And after the register renaming, you will be able to issue, and you will be able to execute, and you will right back or say we order buffer uh, the result from the, uh, the, data bus, the data bus. However, as we said, because there is branch prediction, so there are cases where uh, we are not 100% for, sure, for sure if we really need the result of this execution. So uh, we invented a mode in your mo in modern processor called speculative execution, means that we are speculate that, well, this instruction will be executed. However, it's not uncertain, it's not certain until the branch uh, result is out or uh, we pass the stage that there may be exceptions in your instructions. So, and to support speculative execution, we need a spatial functional unit code a spatial unit called reorder buffer. And um, reorder buffer is nothing too different from uh, like having an instruction queue. So uh, what you actually, uh, uh, it's nothing, it's too, not too different from instruction queue in a way that they also buffer what's the instruction and what's the, what's the physical registers associated with it. So uh, usually you can make the reorder buffer uh, uh, to, you can extend the instruction queue uh, to support the feature of a reorder buffer. And in this way, uh, uh, we have a new stage that replaces the write back stage that only if uh, the outcome of the instruction can be realized, we can, uh, we can kick out the, uh, the instruction from uh, the processor. So that stage is called uh, commit. And an instruction finishes, when an instruction finishes execution, we call it retired. However, if an instruction, uh, if an instruction before that instruction uh, failed to commit, it means that at some point, everything after that instruction that failed to commit is not trustworthy, is not something we want. So we just flush everyone and revert all the architectural status changes made by those instructions. However, without reorder buffer to track what this instruction doing with the, what this instruction did, with uh, those physical registers for architectural states, that's impossible for us to reverse. So that's why you need a reorder buffer to support speculative execution. So, so, so looking at this, right? So this part is your uh, issue logic. So the, 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 the spirit, the soul of all order execution is that your capability to issue all instructions. So in the last lecture, uh, we talk about an example that, uh, and however, that instruction, uh, that example is, uh, we, I have some missing details here. So here I just make 
uh, this example clear enough so that uh, uh, to avoid some confusion. So for this example, I actually want two cycles for integer execution, three cycles to execute, execute memory instruction. And if you remember, the previous pipeline I show is actually four cycles. So here I'm saying like, uh, it's only three cycles. So if it's only three cycles, you can see um, for the first and the second instruction, they don't have dependency, so they can be executed together. However, uh, the third instruction, because it is depend is a memory instruction, so you have to wait for one, two, three to receive its result. So it's here. And uh, for the fourth instruction, it's a branch instruction, depending on the output of uh, the add immediate instruction. So you can see, um, and because it's an integer instruction, so we only need to wait for two cycles. So it can be done here. And um, for the fifth instruction to eight instruction, they are ready at this time. And if you look at the data dependency of the fifth instruction, it's depending on the, the re outcome of two. So um, the outcome of two is ready in the third cycle. So the fifth instruction can only uh, go into the pipeline at the uh, third cycle. And for the sixth instruction, it's also depending on the outcome of two. So in theory, you are able to put it to execution here. However, here I have a restriction called issue with equal to two, meaning that we only have a pipe, we only have two pipelines. So this instruction has to be postponed for one cycle later. Now, uh, let's look at seven and eight. For seven, it's depending on 20, and uh, 20 is generated by three. So seven has to be running here. Um, it can only be here. However, uh, and it also depends on one. So if you look at one, it's actually the outcome from five. So, and for five, one, two, three, it's also ready here. So that's why uh, if I put everything together, the answer to this question would be six. All right, so um, so that's that's an example. That's another walkthrough, another run of the walkthrough of the superscalar uh, auto order issue and real order buffer processor. And now let's look at that. So how far away are we from? Okay, Harris. Wouldn't the answer to the previous question only be six when we're asking uh, just, because six would be, the moment where instruction seven and eight begin, right? It's not the moment yeah, when they so, finish. So, so, so if you look at what a question is asked, issue all instructions. Oh, okay. So you don't care about when they finish. You just care about when, right. how many just, cycles. And as we said, right, because, 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 because you have a pipeline like this, right? So your, your, your capability, your processing capability is actually depending on how how freak well like your capability of putting this command into execution right and uh the real the buffer it was just committed to instruction in order one by one right so it doesn't so this part doesn't matter that much your ipc your your performance is depending on your capability in issue those instructions thank you okay all right so um Okay, so for now, well, how far away are we from the modern processor pipeline? The answer is not too far away. If you look at the Intel processor, right? Instruction cache, uh, the instruction queue, the decode, the decode, rename, right? Register renaming, scheduling, multiple pipelines, memory stage, right? And reorder buffer, right? So everything, everything you, uh, like the reorder buffers, right? Like low buffers, store buffers, right? Everything here we have been talking about. Right, so you 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 complete you can completely understand what the processor is doing now with the knowledge you learn. And if you look at the MD processor, it's also the same philosophy. All right. However, even though I give you a limited uh, issue with, there is still code like linkless this right will have very low ILP. And surprisingly, because how good our computer science education in data structure, they are really they are frequently uh, they frequently appeared in software and uh so 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 there are tons of code that the ilp is low so it turns out that another solution to address this is that since we are not, not able to uh grab 
instruction from just one one process one thread to fill in those pipeline let's just use uh, instructions from different processes or different uh, threads in this way we can utilize those unused slots in your program uh, in your processor to improve the overall throughput or overall performance however one thing you have to be uh, careful about is that because you are also sharing your pipeline with somebody else so some instruction execution may be postponed like in this case um, like instruction a it's uh, it, it may be may not be executed as fast as you can in the past so here is the benefit of simultaneous multi-threading however it also uh, hurts a single thread performance if you didn't program uh, carefully right and um, another modern trend is because of the power consumption issue. So instead of building a processor with faster clock rate that would like make your uh, energy consumption six times more, nowadays we try to double the number of cores. So for this example, even though only 40% of your code can be paralyzed, by doubling the number of cores, you only need to consume 1.6 times more energy. Needless to say, the power consumption is only twice of the original design. However, if you do it with a, uh, 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 a doubling the clock rate, it will be eight times more. And um, um, but so 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 now more, most processor you have is a is a chip multiprocessor like this. You have multiple cores, and each core has its own private cache, and uh, they are they synchronize their data or say they treat. Uh, the less level memory as the front end of your main memory. So that's the that's a concept of uh, chip multiprocessor. So both chip multiprocessor and simultaneous multi-threading they can exploit uh, the uh, thread level parallelism. So I wanted to uh, compare and think about what's the difference and what's the what's the advantage among each of them. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so according to what do you guys think? Well, we actually have pretty close answer between A and B. So why don't you guys go ahead and discuss with your friend to see what you guys think.
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so after discussion, looks like uh, B got more edible cater. So can I have some of you sharing uh, the thoughts that you have heard, the idea that you have heard from your group? Okay, Harris, what do you think? So our group went with B. Um, uh -huh. And the reason we did that was because we figured that it would be much di more difficult to paralyze two different processes that use the same, that are the same instruction type, like ALU or load store branches. Um, but it may be easier to uh, thread them together. So, but, but they are different programs, right? Uh, you mean the processes? Yeah, you have two different processes, right? So what kind of parallelism are you talking about here? Well, like the parallelism between cores and between threads and, well, I mean, because if I have two instructions running on two different cores that both need to use an AL, oh no, but there's multiple ALUs now, so. Right. Mm. So both of them has like two, like, okay, so chip multiprocessor has two issue pipeline on each core, right? But it has two processors, right? right. And, and the four issue pipeline, so two times two, this is four. So they actually have the same. Okay. So does that change your mind? Uh, no, not really, because I'm still confused about um, when is it possible to parallelize like different instructions and when is it not, you know? Well, as long as you don't have data dependency, you can parallelize this instruction. True. As long as you have, you, as long as you don't have uh, your functional units occupied, you can parallelize these instructions. Right? right, and it would be the same case for both um, P1 and P2. In this okay. way, right? In this way, yes. What else? What other thoughts? What other thoughts? Other people? Okay, so I have Armin and I have Byron. Byron, okay, Byron, what do you think? Um, so I was also thinking about the, the shared cache and uh -huh. both X and Y are using data in similar areas or even sharing mm -hmm. data perhaps um it would be a faster load store okay if they are sharing data right but what if they are not sharing data um then um there could be so depending on how it how they work together it could be conflict misses i guess or capacity misses um in terms of right so in this way which others. one will be better probably P1, but there also might be like, and it's also less scheduling um, conflict too, which is nice. Okay, so, okay, keep going. I'm sorry, uh, if there's no um, conflict and no cache issues between the applications, um, then wouldn't P2 be better off because then you would be able to um, multi-thread substantially better than say P1 in this case? Well, yes or no, because both of them have the same amount of caches, right? Right. But, okay, so what if one application used, a, well, so if they have similar memory footprint, memory capacity demand, then P1 will be better, right? But if one use more than the other and the other is not going to uh, create a, a lot of like, you know, pressure on the cache, then P2 will be better. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And speaking about speaking about like uh, the 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 same thing, right? So speaking about those instructions, right? Even though they all have the similar amount of instruction breakdown, but one thing missing here is that what the IPC or ILP 
of each, right? So what if application X just can only use one instruction most of the time? Then P2 would give a better chance for the other instruction to use three pipelines in the meantime, right? However, if both of them has similar, uh, I would say like both of them is like a two, two in terms of their ILP, then P1 is definitely going to be better because it avoids the conflict or the competition among their uh, LUs. Do you agree with that? that? Yeah, but what case happens more often then? Well, both are happening very open, right? So saying that if you have a process that's created from, uh, say if you have a process that's created uh, from the same program, right? They are going and which, like if you are doing a, like a multi-program multi model, right? They are essentially the same program. They will have exactly the same footprint, right? And it happens a lot. For example, your Chrome is one thing like that. And every web server is like that. Right, so in that way, do you think CMP is better or SMT is better? That way, I would think that uh, CMP P is better. CMP is better, right? But if you have a join program like uh, Chrome, again, Chrome is a join program, but you also have a very small program like Word. Well, Word is a big one. Okay, Notepad running together, right? Then which one will give you better performance. Probably P2 then. Right, so so it's case by case, right? It's case by case. So there's no standard, well, so both of you are getting it right, but also not get it right. There is <laughs> no standard answer for uh, this question. And the reason why I put this question up is because this is one type of question you are going to see in a final. Like those questions with, without standard answer is based on if your argument uh, uh, sounds reasonable or not. And thanks a lot for Harris and Byron. I think you give us a very good, um, um, like, you know, good thoughts about that. But also think about when you answer this question, make sure that you present like uh, the other side and try to support your argument a little bit, like uh, put some more uh, constraint on your answer. So like under what situation, this would be better under what situation this will be better, right? But uh, the, the first run of your, your answers were too, too bold, I would say, like uh, without any support of why it is better. So if you put this kind of answer on your final, you may not get full credits because you don't support that with evidences. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Be thanks careful. a lot for both of you. All right, so. Now, uh, so, so now let's go ahead and look at, uh, 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 okay. Now let's go ahead and look. So that's the, that's the, that's, that's the wrap up of what we have in the last lecture. And today, uh, but one thing, one thing, one thing I do want to tell you is that simultaneous multi-threading or chip multiprocessor as well, they are not dropping upgrades to your application. So if you don't make your program parallel, there's no way that a single thread program can uh, utilize the benefit of uh, uh, the benefit of uh, of, uh, of this parallel architecture. So we have to talk about how to do parallel programming in modern processor architecture and how to uh, and what's the what's the issue you will see in 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 this kind of uh, system. All right, so the basic idea of par pro parallel programming right now is that to explore parallelism, you need to break your computation into multiple processes or multiple threads. And for processes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you can use like fork or whatever. And in modern operating system, each process would have its own virtual memory space. And you need to explicitly re exchange data use inter-process communication APIs. So in this model, there is not actually uh, 
a shared memory. It's not a shared memory model. So if you want to share memory, the, the second option would be threads. So uh, the threads is in the independent portions of your program that can be run in parallel and all threads will see the same in their memory space. And um, however, it's a little bit confusing here because in architecture, we call all the above, the processes threads as threads. And, uh, it's, and, and, and the virtual memory, because it's virtual, is actually a shared memory semantics maintained by your operating system. So there is a, because, because of that, there is actually a mismatch between uh, the software in parallel programming and the hardware in parallel programming. So this is a, the cores in your chip multiprocessor. So each core has its own register, it all, and uh, we have shared memory, right? So that's what software thinks about multi-programming hardware. However, as I just demonstrated, is so so they just map a uh, core uh, into the abstraction code thread and map the shared memory into shared virtual address space. However, however. If you look at the hardware design, we actually have private caches in between. So the, the memory are not actually, are not actually uh, private, uh, the, the not actually fully shared, right? So, so that's why, that's, so there is a mismatch between our imagination on the software side and what's really underlying, hard, what really underlying hardware is doing. So, uh, so the, the truth is that you may run different threads on this and uh, you thought I have a sum equal to zero and you, you, your, your thread one think, uh, think sum is equal to zero, thread two in the very beginning, everyone thinks sum is equal to zero. However, later on, each thread may update a sum uh, uh, differently However, others will not be able to see the updated value in one's cache. And if you keep working on this, there will be uh, um, um, different, different, different uh, incorrect result that as you can imagine, right? So on the hardware side, we have to support two things. One is called co coherency. Guaranteed all processors will see the same value for a variable or memory address in a system when the processor needs the value at the same time. So it determines what value should be seen by the program. And consistency means that all threads see the change of data in the same order. So if, uh, if someone want to upgrade, uh, if both, both processes or both threads want to upgrade, uh, update memory address A, one of them, uh, both of them would agree someone uh, of them will go first without uh, the race condition occurring. So this is, this, is the, this is the coherency and consistency. Okay, so to maintain a coherency in your textbook, there is something called snooping protocol. So the basic idea of snooping protocol is that we attach a few states uh, uh, with uh, uh, to your uh, cache blocks and um, uh, to replace your valid valid bit. And this states will represent if your data is valid or invalid. And there are different valid status. So, for example, uh, it some states it mentioned that the data is shared, and some states mentioned that the data is exclusive, meaning that. Uh, this processor core or say this cache is the only one who owns the up-to-date data. And there is a transition diagram to uh, update the states of uh, each cache block. So when, when you, uh, when you, when you, so, so with this, what will happen is that if your thread, in the very beginning, everyone sees sum equal to zero. If one thread like thread one is trying to uh, update sum, then what will happen is that the, the, the thread would broadcast to everybody that, okay, I'm going to invalidate this data. So your copy of sum zero is not, no more, uh, no more trustworthy. And in this way, uh, the thread 
who is currently modifying the data is in exclusive state because it's the only one who owns the up-to-date uh, data. And later on, when somebody else needs to uh, use the updated sum because right now your data is invalidated, it's not valid anymore. So it will become a mess of that cache block. So you will broadcast and this broadcast will force the thread one uh, to write back its current data copy and present that to the shared memory address space, usually in the DRAM or LLC. And then both of them will now have the up-to-date content. So that's uh, how you maintain coherence. Okay, so right now you know you have a coherent cache. Okay, Tui, question? Yeah, I was gonna ask, when you say broadcast, is that like the same or different broadcast of like the process of like synchronizing? Well, so there is a separate, there is a separate uh, network here that connects to everyone's private cache. Uh, but it's just a message bus telling that invalidate this memory address. So it's a hardware broadcast. Oh, so it's not like, okay, I get it. Thank you. Yeah, so this, so this coherent needs, so coherence needs hardware support. You cannot just do it with software. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So assuming, okay, Harry's question. Yeah, so I have actually a question going back to that whole SMT versus CMP question way mm -hmm. back when. It's something, you know, I just realized thanks to chat. It's in that particular question, it does explicitly state both application X and Y have similar instruction combination. Wouldn't similar that- Similar instruction combination means that you have similar breakdown, right? Yeah. But there is right. no guarantee the IPC ILP of each other. Oh, so just because it's a similar combination doesn't necessarily mean you can pipe it. Right. Like of, I can like the linked list code and your general loop, they can have similar combination, right? However, linked list is terribly slow. Right. Okay. Right. I understand. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now let's start with this uh, question on coherence protocol. So look at this question. Can you answer, can you give me your answer? All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so right now, I want you guys to discuss with your friend for maybe one minute or two.
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so look at your uh, discussion result. It looks like C is the most popular answer. So can I have some of you sharing what your group thinks about uh, which one is the, uh, which two, or maybe uh, something else you think uh, that could show up in uh, the code. Okay, so I have two. What do you, what do you think? So our group talked about- I also about... have Harry's. Okay, why don't you guys discuss together? So, Harry's. Uh, our group said, um, the answer was B. There was only one correct. Uh, okay, which one? Uh, number one. Okay, Tweet, what do you think? Um, so our group chose four because in the question it says cache coherency protocol, but mm -hmm. um, the data value being changed and being seen in order, I remember that's co consistency, not coherency. So that's mm -hmm. why we said it could be any of the order above. Okay, so here you have two threads, right? So thread one you can consider is the observer and thread two is uh, the producer, right? Mm -hmm. And the producer keep incrementing the value of A, right? So in this way, do you think you are going to see all of them? No, I don't think so then which one is disqualified? One. One? I, I would say one is actually very qualified if that's the case then. Because if we're using the snooping mechanism where, you know, if thread two updates A and then A, you know, that thread has is declared exclusive and then thread one tries to print A, well then it has to go and check, you know, um, thread two's result, right? Then, then which one is disqualified? Which one's disqualified? Probably four. Four. Okay, let me let me run this. Maybe we we just need a demo, right? So, hold on, hold on. So this is the coherence code. As you can see, I have it incremented to a thousand, right? So that's thread A. So that's thread two. Right, and this is the observer, right? So let me run this program. So for the first time, right, you see a lot of one and finally you got a thousand, <laughs> right? So which one is similar to this one? Uh, four. Number four. Four, okay, four, right? Run it again, right? Oh, you got one, 136, a thousand. Which one is qualified? That's three. That three. That three. Okay, right, run it several times. Oh, you got a lot of interesting values, right? So, well, but a now, which, which one don't you think is possible? One. Well, it's highly unlikely, let's. Well, it's this. highly unlikely, right? But for one, if you have a really slow processor, right? It will <laughs> possible, right? right but yeah. what really is possible is two. Right, because mm -hmm. for two, if your thread two is incrementing your value like one, two, three, four, right? You are not able to see this back to the future value. Right, so, so uh, do you mind if I just clarify something again? Sure. Con uh, coherency is the idea that all the processors will see the value of the shared data. Right. Um, but consistency is the idea that each of the threads will execute in order. Right, in all the Okay. And so the reason that even though we have coherency, you can still get an answer like four is because we can have situations where thread two like executes a hundred times before thread one does something. So right. even though thread one sees the correct, you know, it looks at thread two, oh, if the value is a hundred, yeah, but thread two wasn't supposed to execute a hundred times. Exactly, right? So thinking okay. about like your, yeah, thinking about, so so there's no guarantee that thread two must be running at a same speed as thread two. And in fact, both of them would have different instruction count, different ILPs, right? So thinking about how complex printf is, right? Like 
uh, the printf of Hello World, it takes about 500,000 instructions in C. Remember that? Right. Right, but A++, in, it's just one as 86 instructions, right? So when you execute the printf on the left-hand side, the right-hand side has already like fly a long way, right? So that's why most of the time you are going to see three and four, but not one and a one, but two is never possible. Right. Are you, okay, are you guys both okay with that? So the answer is yeah. really three, D. Yeah, it's actually yeah. the least popular answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right, glad that you guys knowing that, wow, parallel programming is actually hard. I thought my program should be looks like this, but it's actually not like that. And it's actually even more difficult. And remember that if you, if you uh, finish your assignment one, you should have an idea like every time when I have a miss, I am bringing the whole block. A block contains many elements, consecutive elements. So every time when I have a miss, for example, like I have, uh, I have array, uh, I have an array A, and now uh, I thread one would like to update an element in array uh, array uh, in 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 array uh, in this a array, right? So uh, whenever you update a zero, you are going to update other people's whole block like this. So even though like thread two is working on array element number one instead of number zero, it's a one will be invalidated as well. So this is called false sharing, right? This is called false sharing. And this way, your performance will be really bad. So, um, so, in, so if you look at this pieces of a code, right? If I have the left-hand side version, which my thread try to interleave. So, so here, every time when, so if I am thread zero, right? I start with zero. Then the, if I have four threads, right? The next element that I would access is, uh, is four. And then I would go to, uh, I equal to eight. And for this one, I present, uh, I, I partition the task in chunking. So, uh, so like, it's more like uh, thread one work on this part and thread two work on this part of your code, right? So in this way, uh, so your memory access pattern would actually be more like, uh, so, so, so if you have two threads and it's more like, okay, I have a ray C and, uh, if you, I have two threads, then two threads would interleave, uh, uh, would interleave their access in a memory. And as you can imagine, this pieces of a code would have a lot of this force sharing case. And this force sharing case would actually create uh, invalidation of other people's block. And this would actually be the four, four C in cache miss code, coherence means meaning that your block is invalidated because of the sharing among processors. So, uh, so now you, you learn false dependencies, they are also false sharing. So the case of false sharing is that processor A modifies X, processor B wants to access Y. However, Y is the invalid because X and Y are in the same block. That's called false sharing. So for, for that piece of a code, I actually have a demo that I can show you. So uh, here I have, okay, this is a, Matrix add, and this is the uh, the SSE version. Well, SSE version. Well, actually, I think my code matrix. Okay, okay. So this is the this is the. Uh, okay, I don't think that was the program that I'm looking at. Two threads. Okay, this one. So for this program, right? I have it's just two threads, and I have two pieces of a code. And if I am using uh, the, 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 the chunking algorithm, uh, the chunking, which is the right-hand side, uh, it will run this piece of a code. Otherwise, it will just do the interleaving. So let's look at the performance of uh, interleaving and uh, the, uh, two threads and the chunking. So if I just run, if I just run the interleaving version, right, do I have a default value here? Okay, it takes about how many seconds? This is three or eight. 
uh, three, right? But if I run it with the chunking version, right, it's actually faster, right? So, so that's so that's why it's it's important that you make sure that you try to uh, try to uh, address the uh, the false sharing issue. Harris, do you have question? Uh, yes, I do. So in regards to false sharing, right? There can mm -hmm. also be situations where like processor A modifies both X and Y, right? Like yes. everything in that block is modified due to some process. Would that right. not, would that still be false sharing? Would that qualify as That will sharing? be true sharing. Okay, so false sharing is where, you know, X and Y are in the same block, only X changes, but because X changed and they're both in the same block, Y is now invalidated. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Tui, you also have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Like the example that you were just doing, is mm -hmm. that like is that like fine versus coarse multi-threading or no? Also? Yeah, this is like a multi-threading, the P thread multi-threading. So it's like coarse versus fine? Or just uh, simultaneous? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the core, 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 yeah, coarse grain and the fine grain. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. All right. So this is the force sharing. And now uh, let's look at, uh, uh, okay. So, so another, another case that I want to show you here is that, okay, you think uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, multi threaded programming is easy. So uh, I have a program like this. So, Thread one is the observer, and thread two is the producer. Well, sorry, the other side, right? Thread one is the, no. Okay, thread two is the producer, and thread one is the observer. So thread two, it modified the value of loop, and it will propagate the value to the main thread. And whenever the loop is equal to zero, whenever, whenever the loop value is equal to zero, then I would, uh, zero equal to one, the main thread will finish, right? So this is a very simple naive program, right? So that, and you might think about, okay, what's, the, what's wrong with it, right? So let me show you what's wrong with it. So here I have a loop variable, which is a global variable. So both, both functions, they will see that. And modify loop, right? Then uh, it will ask you to input a value. So right now let's run this test loop. So if I run this test loop, and well, definitely ask you to input a number, right? And if it's if it's four, well, because it's not one, so it will finish, right? But if I press a number called one, it will keep going, right? Keep going and never finish. Okay, so now this program is right now not optimized. So some of you would say, hey, we should optimize for performance, right? So you put dash O3 like this. Okay, so let me put another version, O3. And let's put the non-optimized version as O0. Right. So, okay, this, right. So right now I'm running the test loop and I'm running the optimized version. So I give you another number like four, 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 four. It doesn't finish after optimize it, you think your program should finish faster, but it doesn't finish. So compiler optimization is sometimes dangerous in parallel programming because it will cause the program to not finish or not acting as what it is. So can some of you tell me why do you think this would happen? Like why after turning on the compiler optimization, this program code doesn't work anymore. Okay, I have Harris. What do you think? Um, so I think it might be because consistency is now violated. Like one of the threads is actually optimized to the point where it's going quickly, too quick. And now things are not happening in order. Okay, but 
in this way, there might be a chance that it will finish, right? Right. But you know, like this many runs that I have been trying, it never finishes. Hmm. Why is that? Hmm. I don't know. Someone else? But thanks for sharing. And okay, but do you, so, so, okay. Okay, Byron? Well, the initial value of loop is set to one, right? So I um, think that maybe what it's, it's doing, it's reading the loop before, oh wait, no, ah, hold on. There's something special about that one, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Something special about that one. Okay, so so here's the thing, right? Thanks a lot. And so here's the thing, right? So remember, compiler optimization. So, and it, it actually also give you an idea like how different is it between uh, the, 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 so, so, so that's why sometimes I really want you guys to read, to be able to read the uh, assembly language. So let's look at the, the, Okay, did I dump them? Okay, so I do generate an object dump of its assembly code. So let's look at the assembly language that we have here. So if it's a main function, okay, this is a p thread create. This is a this is a this is a this is a join, right? So between here, this is the loop. So here you are seeing that uh, the s eighty six assembly language is compare the uh, and if if you look at this, right? So this is this has a quote in here. So that's actually, well, that, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but it's actually like a, uh, 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 I would say it's like a compare instruction with memory access. So you are comparing the value in a memory address with one, right? So that's uh, the assembly code generated by the non-optimized version. And remember, if you have a, 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 a quote like this here, it's actually a memory address and it's accessing memory. However, if you use the optimized code, what happened here is that, okay. So right now is comparing with, uh, with a memory address first, and then jump not equal, and then call Q, and then jump EE0. So here, what do you see, right? What do you see here is that uh, first, it still compare. Okay, so, so let's look at the, the, the code here. So the code here, the code in, uh, in the not optimized version is that it goes to, uh, it, it compare first, and then uh, if the comparison result is not in favor, is not one, then it will loop, is one, then it will loop back, right? And when it loop back, it go to EC3. However, if you look at the optimized code, if you look at the optimized code, what would happen here is that the jump instruction just keep going to itself. The jump instruction just keep going to itself. So what Byron says is actually correct in a way that the compiler optimization sees that loop equal to one. And if you go, uh, if you have been taking like CSE 131, there is something called constant propagation. So they would, uh, they would have a check here to see if the loop is one. And if the loop is one, they will replace the loop with a constant called one. And since one is always equal to one, so it's going to be an infinite loop generated here. That's by the compiler optimization. And the reason why compiler wants to do that is because it wants to avoid memory accesses. So the solution here is that you should put a volatile keyword in front of a variable that will be shared uh, to make sure that the compiler optimization not putting your value to register, but instead making sure that every time when you access this variable, it will be put into the memory. So what happened if we put a, a volatile keyword in front of the loop is that a volatile keyword in front of the loop. And now if I compile it 
if I if I use test loop and right now if I input a number four, it will finish, right? So it will fix the problem if you put a volatile keyword in front of your shared variable among different threads. All right, so that's one thing, right? So right now, well, even though I put all variable become volatile, I still have a question that I want to ask you. So look at this pieces of a code. How many values do you think is possible? All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so according to what do you guys think, it looks like both C and D, they are popular answers, but don't forget like how how unconvincing your, your classmates are. So why don't you go ahead and discuss with your friend and synchronize your answer. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds.
five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now um, uh, looks like most of you think the answer is C. So can I have some of you sharing your thoughts with us? Okay, I have Harris. So our group actually thinks the answer is D. D, okay. All right. So the reason we think it's D is because if, so A, B, X, Y, F, they're all volatile, right? I mean, that, mm -hmm. Those values just stored in the memory, um, they're gonna be read by different threads. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we don't necessarily know the order in which modify A and modify B are gonna be run. Percent. Right. So, so this thread, although they create, uh, like A goes for, well, it sounds like we create for A first, B, B second, right? But there's no guarantee A will run faster than B or which one is going to be executed first, right? Right. Now, if A, modify A executes first, then what we're going to get is A is equal to one and X is equal to B, which is zero, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And for that thread, that's going to point out one zero, and then modify B is going to do B equal to one, Y equals to A, which is now one, which means that thread is going to print out one one. Okay. But if modify B runs first, then it's going to be zero one. I'll say again. What, what's the other value you just mentioned? One one. One one. Yes. Okay, but how does that happen? Can you that, repeat that again? Uh, sure. That happens when modify A executes uh, first, and then modify B executes because now A is modified and changed into the value one. So when A, when, so you are saying about like, is that if A goes completely in before B, then what would happen is that A would equal to one and X would equal to uh, B, which is, oh no, you are, you are saying about like they are. No, I'm talking okay. about modified B. Like, let's say modify A completely finished, right? And then modify yeah. execute. Well, A at this point is equal to one in modify B. So then I, Y would equal to one as well. So what you are saying here is actually the case of interleaving, right? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with that term. Okay, so you are saying about a case that well, I finish executing A equal to one and then I go to B equal to one, right? So X would be one and Y would equal to one, right? That's mm -hmm. four, yeah. right? But if you have one of them finished earlier, so if I have A equal to one finished earlier, then X will be equal to zero. So that would right. be two, right? And if I have this one goes faster, then Y would be equal to zero, right? So right. That would be two, three, four, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. here, here are the possible scenarios, right? That you guys are thinking. So good. First of all, if thread one goes first, and we start executing a equal to one, and then thread two goes slightly uh, slower, but we just execute y equal to a, then it turns out that we got one one, right? And another scenario is like, okay. Uh, what if I have this one of this going faster, the other one going slower, then you will get to one and zero, right? But one thing you just don't agree is that there shouldn't be anything like one, one, right? So what if we have a demo and see if that would change your mind? So this is the code, uh, modify A, modify B, and uh, it is exactly the same code. And right now I compiled it and uh, uh, let me run this. Oh, professor, yes. One of the thing, well, at least for my birthday, thing that we don't think can happen is zero zero, not one one. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I want to say, right? So okay, for zero zero, right? So let's look at, right? So like for this program, oops. Right. Okay, right. If you run it several times, sometimes you will get to this, right? So if you have a, if you if you, if you know how to use like shell script, right? You can actually uh, write a shell script and then you can run like uh, this program several times and say like, I have uh, 
uh, I just want to uh, output this to a file like this, and then, oops, oops, touch. And then let me do it again. While and then uh, fence and temp.txt. And okay, oops. Didn't do it well. Okay, so I should get this and then do this. Okay, so now if I go to look at the output of the file, most of them would be. Zero, 01 but if you look at that carefully so let's do a search right so let's say is there anything like 10 there is a 10 right so is there anything like 11 one, one? there is no 11 one, one. how come okay. uh, wait 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 so do give a second Infense is the case okay yeah so maybe i didn't run it for a sufficient amount of time right so let me run it more times Okay, and let's see what it is now. Okay, so one one. Here is a one one, right? Okay. So we do have one one, a lot of zero one, right? One zero, right? Mm -hmm. So now the question is that is there going to be zero zero? The answer is yes. Oh, really? Really, right. Yeah. How come? Oh, does, right? so oh, does here, that mean main executes before thread one and thread two? So here's the thing. Don't forget in your processor within each thread one and thread two, they do out of order scheduling. Mm -hmm. And when we do out of order scheduling, the scheduler is per core. So I can potentially reorder x equal to b to execute before a equal to one. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Nick, do you have a question? Yeah. So I noticed there was a lot more in zero ones. Does that mean thread one is much faster than thread two? So it well, does... it's just because the program order we launch the thread one first, right? So in this processor, because my computer has like eight cores, so uh, there is a higher chance that the thread one because it's scheduled is executed for is launched first though it gets the core immediately right but there are still cases that uh, thread one is running slower than thread two okay yeah uh, i actually do have uh, another question involving the optimization come to think mm -hmm. of it is don't doesn't snooping um no snooping doesn't detect uh what is it wouldn't declare exclusive on a value in a register, it would do that for a cache, wouldn't it? Right. Well, okay, right. Right, so, yeah, so the thing is that the, the, the coherence model cannot prevent your processor or compiler to reorder instructions that's running on each single core. So although your program order looks like I should always execute A equal to one first, but don't forget your compiler, your processor, would reorder this a equal to one and x equal to b. And that's how you get the value of zero, zero. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks a lot, right? So from this, I think you must learn a lot that, that you know, like how come, right? So, 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 so everything here is possible, right? So your computer, in parallel programming, a lot of programming paradigm, a lot of stuff that you trust in the past, they are not trustworthy anymore. So you need architectural support for that. So S86 provides an MFAST in, in fence instruction to prevent reordering across the fence instruction. So what it does is that, that if you put an M fence between A equal to one and S equal to B, it will prevent the A equal to one and S equal to B to be reordered in your uh, compiler. However, uh, by your compiler as well as your processor. However, because as you can imagine, in, even with this case, even with this case, you are still going to see three of the outcome, right? So, 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 so it's so hard 
is so hard. So the takeaways for parallel programming here is that processor behaviors, they are not deterministic. You cannot predict which processor is going fast. You cannot predict the, what OS is going to do. And cache, cache coherency only guarantees that everyone will eventually have a coherent view of data, but not when. And we talk about consistency, but not actually anyone support the, the, the very strict consistency model. Harry's question. So if MFence exists on the assembly level, is there any equivalent on the higher level for like C? Uh, intrinsic. <laughs> oh. Because, because let me tell you why. Because the MFence is not a standard support for across all architectures. And oh. it's something that we like the hardware to support. So if you are in a different architecture, there's no guarantee that will be supported and it cannot be implemented in hardware. So uh, it's not possible to have C that making that a standard. Right, it's very similar then to atomic functions then for OSs. Exactly, oh. yes. Okay, all right, so this is the takeaways for parallel programming and it's really hard. So uh, we have a few minutes left. I do want to mention to you, right now we are living in a world of dark silicon. What it really means by dark silicon is that we are currently in a world that our power consumption per transistor is not reducing. So what would happen is that in the past, Moore's law uh, allow us to, well say like I have a chip with 49 transistors. And in the past, the total cost, and let's say each transistor would cost one watt of power. In the past, with Moore's law and D not scaling, we can shrink uh, the transistor size. In addition, we can shrink the power consumption by half. So even though I have twice more transistors within the same area, my power consumption remains about the same. However, what really happens right now is that this power scaling doesn't work because your leakage power is trying to taking over. And remember, the more transistors you have, the more leakage power you have. So the per transistor power consumption remains the same. So it turns out that if you, more slow, okay, so first of all, I want to clarify one thing. More slow is not dying, it's still living well. You can still put more transistors in there. However, what really broken is the Dina scaling which is the capability allow us to reduce the power consumption per transistor due to uh, the, the, the fact that leakage power is now uh, the, or say static power is now the main contributor of your power consumption. So in this way, right now you can only power on half of a chip or you just cannot put that many of, 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 of you know, of, of uh, that many hardware units within the same chip. And that's why you see the process of performance starting to slow down. And this, and in this case, right, because you, your total power cut budget is limited. So it's like, you guys must just experience, right, the, uh, the, the power outage at your place, right? So it's, it's, it's very hard for us to like, you know, increase the power plant within a very short period of time. So, however, because it's so hot, so everyone is trying to turn on their AC. So it turns out that, you know, only part of the California can enjoy the AC, but the rest part of the California, we are not going to have electricity in this case, right? So dark silicon problem is like that. The total power consumption of a chip is limited, but the per, per transistor power consumption is not reducing. So it turns out if you want to put more transistors in, then it's impossible for us to supply everyone. So it turns out that half of your circuit will be dark. So that's the dark silicon problem. And because of the dark silicon problem, right now we have a lot of approach in, a lot of new things in architecture, computer architecture going on. Like the, the latest NVIDIA's Turing architecture, uh, well, not the latest, soon to be the second latest architecture. It incorporates something called tensor core unit, and uh, which is the, which is the TCU here. However, if you look at about uh, the programming model in Turing architecture is that, well, you, if you want to use tensor cores, you have to tell we are going to use tensor cores. You have to convert them into the data format that tensor cores can accept uh, and then call the functions. However, when we say you, well, I'm going to use tensor cores, 
what would happen is that we only activate the cancer course, but not the rest part of the circuit to make sure that we are not uh, going over the power budget by not powering on. And on the other hand, if you are doing the general purpose uh, um, um, GPU workload, they will not go into the TCU and they will turn them off. So that's one strategy that's currently uh, happening right now is that we just don't turn on most of them and we try to uh, give different parts, uh, we try to activate different parts of your circuit for different workloads. And the other thing is that we start to build application specific uh, ICs. So let's say if I want to build a general purpose processor, then it takes this pipeline, right? However, if I, all I want to do is, uh, is AI plus equal to AI plus one times 20, right? Uh, I don't, I, I can, I, I don't need, I probably don't need an instruction fetch unit because I know this is the instruction that I'm going to execute, right? I probably don't need that many registers because I only have like a few values, right? And I don't need very uh, complex LUs for address calculation because I know this is the only function that I want to perform, right? So it turns out your pipeline can be just having these elements and it could be very quick, very short, very uh, with very few amount of circuits. So, uh, and you can still pipeline it like this, right? So, uh, so, a, a philosoph so, a, a, so this is called application specific IC and Google, they built their tensor processing unit like this to execute machine learning workload. And if you're familiar with machine learning, like, or say like deep learning workload, most of them are doing matrix multiplication right now. So as you can see, the whole processor only have a big matrix multiplication unit and a buffer to store their inputs and outputs, right? And that's built by Google, not any hardware company. So uh, before we leave the lecture, there is a few things I want to tell you. So first of all, you know, computer architecture is more important than you can ever imagine now. Being a programmer is easy and you need to know architecture has a lot of to do with, uh, but you still have to know architecture a lot to be a performance programmer. So in this class, I have shown you the demo on branch prediction on cache. I also show you the multiprocessor case, so it's not easy, right? And in the future is the multi-core era. And you know, like how hard it is. You just saw like how difficult it is to deal with coherence and consistency to make your program right. And again, we are now in the dark silicon area. And as we have heard many times, single core is not getting any faster. And multi-core doesn't scale anymore as well because you are not able to put more transistors within the chip anymore. And you are going to see more and more application specific ICs. Okay, Harris, three questions. Uh, so my question is, oh, sorry, you can go. You can go, you can go, sorry. Okay. Um, so my question is actually going back to, um, what is it, consistency in threading. Is making variables like volatile really the only defense we have to maintain consistency? Because if a lot of the other stuff we can't- Coherency, co coherency. Not oh wait, consistent. coherency. So is there anything we could do for consistency then? Well, M fence. Right. Oh, uh, but that's not nearly as consistent through across different processors. Right. So, all right. Okay, well, Tui, what was your question about? Um, so my question is, so you said basically right now we're moving toward application specific um, unit mm -hmm. processing. So that's like the same as going, kind of like going backward to before, because you know how before computers just like each yeah. one of them can only yeah. do one thing. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yep. I'm just. Okay. But you have you. to write program to utilize those application specific ICs. So mm -hmm. that's why I want to emphasize this to you guys. And right now, I, and, and, and sometimes, right, like they, ha they have to hire engineers to, write this application specific IC. So that's great that you guys have like, you know, experience with very long because in Google, they have a huge TPU team in their cloud infrastructure that writes very long every day. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not uh, logistics. So first of all, uh, if you haven't done this, make sure that you complete your CAPE 
And uh, assignment five is up. You are encouraged to practice on that. Regarding the final exam, I test, I, I saw some of your response on Piazza. I also hear some of your voice through the, uh, through the survey. And I think uh, some of you do have uh, issues with uh, lockdown browser because of your operating system. So we are not going to use that. However, as you can imagine, the final format would be uh, somehow like the midterm in a way that it's going to be long enough for you to not have in time open book, open notes. So although we say it's an open book, open notes exam, however, like the midterm, we just want to make it long enough make it uh, deep enough to not having to let you guys not having time doing this kind of work. So uh, that's a change we are going to make implement in a final that we are not going to use lockdown browser and this time there's no zoom no response on the Piazza post for fairness and uh, the, 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 the question is going to be uh, we, we just go, we will have a lot of questions. And other than that, thanks a lot for participating in the class. And tomorrow we will have a final review, which is going to reveal a lot of details about uh, what's going on in the final. So don't miss that. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Was good to know you. But I'm not gonna pretend I'm more better. Thought we were forever. Heart still in pieces. In your shadow.